Margaret Voss, and today is Tuesday, August 12th, 2014. I'm here at the College of St. Cloud State University's radio studio, KBSC, with Jessica Osman. Jessica, can you spell your name for me and tell me your title? Sure. It is J-E-S-S-I-C-A and then Ostman, O-S-T-M-A-N, and then the Director of Campus Involvement at St. Cloud State. Well, today, Jessica, uh, I'd like to just have you think back over the years of the Lemonade Concert and Art Fair. It is one of those signature events on our campus that, um, well, we've been doing it, what, for 41 years. Yes. The 41st just happened. Mm -hmm. Actually, well, back in June. What's been your role, Jessica, over the years? And just kind of talk through with me what it all entails. What does it all involve to put on an event such as Lemonade Concert and Art Fair? Well, my role has been, I've been involved since 1996 with the event. That's when I started as the director of university programming, working with the university program board in Atwood Memorial Center. And my role then when I took on that position was to be the campus person that worked on the Lemonade Concert and Art Fair Fair, along with our community partner, um, Ginny Tennant, who was at that time part of the St. Cloud Community Arts Council, I believe was the name of the group. And they had been working on that event, and Ginny was their volunteer and liaisoned with us in planning the event. And Ginny has actually been a part of that event since the beginning in 1974. Since the very first. She's the only person that I know that has been involved in planning every single one of the events. And she's really involved more in the artist side, um, the art vendors, and and semi-jurying them and doing all of that coordination. And then our role, or my role, was to coordinate the whole grounds, the facilities, the production aspects, the music, the other entertainment. And Ginny and I worked hand-in-hand on all of that. We would meet regularly. We would look at um, the musicians and the different added on events together. Um, Ginny really did, though, do the artist part pretty much herself with, you know, just doing all of the aspects of communicating, of soliciting new vendors and bringing new ideas to the table. And then she would assign all the booths and do all of that part of the event. And then um, we would liaison with our facilities folks and Ginny would come meet. She knew all of our campus people by name. They all knew her. It was Ginny with the Lemonade Concert and Art Fair. And so we just had a really great partnership working together. We involved on our end of things a lot of student involvement because um, the university program board was student-driven. And so those students then and our graduate assistants that were here in the summer got to experience this large-scale event. And they really got to help put on all aspects of the event and um, were there day of, were there prior prior planning with us. So, um, gosh, it was just a huge undertaking that really kind of went on all year. Um, so you actually begin planning for the event when, starting in, usually it happens in June, correct? Yes, yep. Well, we would start planning for the next year when we would wrap up the earlier year because we would talk about what went well, what did we want to change for the next year. So we would at least start that conversation, start thinking about that, um, and then we'd really start sending out materials to the artists, you know, Early late December, early January kind of would, would be when we'd communicate with artists, but we'd be negotiating contracts for some of the performers before that. We would be thinking logistics before that. Ginny would be recruiting new vendors going to art fairs before that as well. So it really started right when the event ended. That night so, we did a wrap-up actually every year. <laughs> so every year the well, uh, the event would be over yes. about 9 o'clock at night, loadout would happen, and then you'd yep. have your kind of wrap-up meeting that evening. Our informal wrap-up meeting would happen at the Green Mill with uh, half-price appetizers, <laughs> and we would talk about the event. And then we usually did um, a meeting on campus a couple weeks later and a, an email out to everyone that was involved to get feedback as well. And in a very formal kind of setting. setting to yes, do that. that was in, yes, in a meeting setting. So yes. talk through the day, Jessica. What does a day entail? You know, do you... The the Lemonade Art Fair actually begins at 11 o'clock, yes. right? Um, the concert is usually 8 is o'clock, eight? Mm-hmm. 8 o'clock at night. Yep. Uh, there was usually a pre-concert event that took place, entertainment throughout the day. But yep. 
What is the day like? What, what does it really begin for an 11 o'clock art fair? Well, actually, it begins days before the event, actually, in many respects, because our whole campus gets all the facilities folks are involved in this. So we've got a day, we have a scheduled minute by minute, hour by hour schedule that really starts the week before the event. And some of it is around grounds and moving things around and fixing things up and cutting tree branches that are in the way of booths. Some of it is Ginny would go around and number all the booth spaces, you know, between 250 and 300 spaces numbered with tape, bending over, doing all that work. And Ginny would never want help, always wanted to do that all herself. Never have we helped with that. And this year might have been the first year where she is training in a new uh, person to help her. And that was the first year she probably had someone even involved in it at all. And so that started a week, at least a week before. And then, um, you know, we would be hanging banners up uh, the week before for promotion and then hanging logistics banners up, you know, a couple days before, putting signage up the night before. Um, We had some vendors come in the night before, so Ginny would be here. We had food vendors coming in the night before. And so a number of us would be here the night before. And then literally we would show up on campus, a group of us, at 4 or 5 in the morning. In the morning. In the morning to set up the info booth to make sure signage was correct, to get all the check-in locations ready, and make sure tables and chairs were where they needed to be. And with the staff, usually did it all, and we would just double-check and maybe adjust a few things. And then really our volunteers would start arriving at 6, and they would then be stationed at the various locations. And we had community volunteers that Ginny would recruit from the arts a community and other parts of the community and some of her colleagues. And then we had lots of students. We had a faculty and staff from St. Cloud State were involved as well. And it was just a real fun, it's really a fun, energizing event. And it's amazing from 6 in the morning to 11, that time goes so fast. We move in between 200 and 300 vendors. You know, in the old days it was 300. We've kind of uh, changed our spacing a little bit. Now we're down to about that 250, which seems to be real good for the campus. But we would get them all in in a couple hours, and it they, it would just look like they were there forever, set up and going. So my guess would be that you have all these vendors that are coming in to mm-hmm. this destination yes. from not only throughout the state of Minnesota, but actually you have some vendors that come in from across the country. Definitely. And Ginny, uh, the funny thing about Ginny is she knows every single vendor by name, where they're from, what they sell. So you could go back probably in time, and she could tell you, you know, I know we've had people from Arizona and different states for sure. But Ginny, literally, if you say, who sells that, you know, art that looks like this, Ginny will be able to pull that out of her head and just tell you. And so that, uh, you know, we have some longtime vendors that have been around. I'm not sure if we even have vendors maybe who have been to every one, some of them for sure, and maybe two of them. But Ginny knows all of this, and we have it all documented. And then, you know, we have some really high-profile vendors that always come, like Trisco Jewelers, and, you know, we've had some potters that have been, you know, just, it's amazing, the vendors. Um, so, you know, on the art side of things, that's really cool. And then we also have some of the music components that have been really, you know, we've had Paul Imholt, for instance, at every event yeah. that I've been at. He's yeah. been at every one, I believe. So, you, beside the the yeah. artists, yes. and we, we're referring to them as vendors, vendors but yes. really, they're artists. Yes, semi-juried, handmade art. So, they there is a criteria, Yes, and every applicant is then reviewed by Jenny. Yes. And she will ask for photos and yes. verification that... This is fits into this artistic yep. rather than pre-made, fabricated yes. Uh, materials. Yes, and it's not juried. It is semi-juried, semi-juried. meaning handmade um, and has and some she art reviews. Value. She reviews. And, and reviews it. But we do have crafters that do handmade work that's just beautiful. It's art, basically. But art, it, art you know, and you would call some of the, it craft, but it's handmade and handcrafted, and therefore it fits into the semi-juried mode of what okay. we do here. And you had mentioned that um, uh, in at one point you had over 300 vendors. Mm-hmm. Now you've settled down to about that 250 range. Yep. We've had anywhere from 225 to 265 in the, over the last 15 years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what type of art? You've mentioned some already. Pottery. Yes, uh, watercolor, jewelry. Ph- jewelry, photography, clothing, a lot of clothing. I'm surprised by how much clothing. Um, oh, so many things, uh, metal work, uh, sculpture, garden sculptures, rock, stone, granite art, um, 
you, you name it, you find it. It really unique things that you you just don't find everywhere. And so, people come to shop. I mean, that's really why this event I think has been successful is because people come and the and the artists and vendors. The word travels. They're happy because it's busy. There are people here, shopping, enjoying the time. But they're shopping, and that's it's an art fair for that reason. Definitely, it exposes people to art and artists, but um, it also is a place where people can get unique things for their homes, for their gardens, for their gifts, for their cabins, for wherever. It's it's just unique pieces that you wouldn't even imagine. I mean, there's so many categories, I can't even tell you all of them. And uh, my guess is that you have some regular artists, meaning each and every year this is on their place to be. Mm-hmm. They're coming to St. Cloud yes. State University to the Lemonade Concert and Art Fair. But do you have new artists that join you? Yes, every year there's a mix because part of that is Ginny going around to art fairs and picking up cards of different people who've never been. And um, so she's always done that. And now we're kind of getting getting into that digital age where we are now moving to an online application system for the first time starting for next year, which also advertises your art fair to any artist that's at any other fair that's on this system. So I think it's just going to, it's evolving, and um, we've had to figure out that balance of the personal touch, because I think that's part of what makes Lemonade special, is all the artists know Ginny. Seriously, Ginny's the face of the art fair. They all know her. She handwrites things to them. She personalizes things. She knows them by name, and that's really unique and special. But yet, we also have the newer artists that really want to do online, digital, you know, upload their pictures, not sending hard pictures. So we have to find a balance. And so therefore, that's what we're working on now is working on doing both, having both processes in place to be able to capture the audiences and allow for everyone to get involved in the event, but keep where Ginny is still the art coordinator and involved. It's just, there's so much um, changing in the technology, but we we don't want to lose the personal touch that the lemonade Mm -hmm. has always had. Never. And that's really, really special. So let's go back to, you were talking about um, the music yeah, part yeah. of the day. And so you have roving artists yes. or performers throughout the day. Talk a little bit about that. Yes. we. So Paul Imholt is a staple at the event. He's a string musician, and he travels around. He pushes his cart all over, which is perfect because he can go to areas that are, you know, seem like a perfect place to play, and there's people gathered. And people look for him every year, and, if you know, they want to know where Paul is. And he travels around to the different locations on campus. Then we also have booth spaces where we have allowed artists. They come in, and they, we don't, they're, they're, they get a free booth space to perform, but they also can sell their CDs. But it allows exposure to different types of music. So we've done that as well. We also have really used this really cool um, World Common Garden area on our campus for uh, student performers, which we've really partnered with, like the music department and the St. Cloud area jazz groups, children's groups, young young performer groups, and they've performed in there and showcased their talents. We've used small local bands, small local um, individuals singing in those areas. We've done musician, uh, comedians, magicians children's related art over by the children's area i mean we've just done all kinds of musicians and and different performers so that so that as folks are walking around Mm -hmm. campus they they're shopping they're also being entertained with performing arts yes exactly with the we've done storytelling i mean yeah the whole kids area we can get to at some point too to talk about but the other the other main or main component is that orchestra piece in the evening and yeah, and I think one of you know one of the reasons I think this is such a unique event is it really makes symphony music diff- that music available to all because many people will not buy a ticket and go or can't afford it or have never been exposed that way. But this allows it's like a family friendly. It, it's inviting and it's an atmosphere where kids can come and if they're getting up walking around, no one you know really freaks out. But if you're in a you know an, a venue that's made for performing arts like an orchestra. It's a little less accessible to people, so this really makes that art form accessible and kind of get, gets new user, new people that are interested in that, and really promotes you know that type of of art. So I think this whole event is just makes art all around accessible, and it's really unique. So the the first few years um, of Lemonade Concert and Art Fair really featured our world renowned 
Minnesota Orchestra. Mm-hmm. I think that was before my time, but yes, yeah, I saw records your time. of this. Yeah. Yes, and but now we have become really uh, great partners with Syncloud Symphony. Yes. So, talk a little bit about um, that event. Um, the orchestra performs a free concert. Yes. Outdoor. Yes, it's beautiful. And the program lasts about an hour, mm-hmm. hour in length. And the program is a family oriented program. Yes. So you say families can come to the event with their children. Yes. Who can play, can listen, listen, can dance, dance, <laughs> dance uh, clap, yep. and really be exposed to the culture of an orchestra yes. uh, performing. And that really is the idea of the whole day, isn't mm-hmm. it? It really is. Um, it, it is highlighting the rich cultural community of the greater St. Cloud area. Yes. And I'll never, I'll rem- my first year um, in the position, I remember we had to decide what orchestra, what we should do for the orchestra. And, you know, budget was really tight. And we had had Minnesota, we had had the St. I think the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra had performed, but there was some issues with some of that, like timing and dates. And so we were like, well, we have a local orchestra, and um, this event is part of the City Festival. At that point, when I first started, it was Wheels, Wings, Water Festival. Now it's Granite City Days, but it's that partnership with the city. And so we're like, why wouldn't we, let's try the St. Cloud Symphony Orchestra and feature that. And it's interesting because many, many of the members, or a high number of the members are involved with St. Cloud State um, through the music department and then also some of our students are in the orchestra and then we've got local students in high schools and even junior high some of those outstanding students are in the orchestra so we did that the first year and then we really evaluated and said wow this just seems like a no-brainer we should really be featuring the St. Cloud Symphony Orchestra and then it becomes a win-win because then really those people that go are like wow this is cool let's buy season tickets or let's Let's go. So it really made sense, I think, and that's really then stuck with us. We have not, since then, have not had another orchestra. It's always been the St. Cloud Symphony Orchestra. So that's, you know, since 1996. Or actually 1997, that would be, because I started in the fall of 96. so 1997. So 97 and on, it's been the St. Cloud Symphony Orchestra as our featured event. Now we have had a couple special anniversaries where we've had a noon performance added in. Oh, for because of a like anniversary? The twi- yeah, the 25th annual, we did that. Um, and we wrote a big grant and were awarded a large um, Arts Across Minnesota grant for that festival. And, oh, we added so much value. And some of the things continued on after that event. Um, I noticed uh, in um, some of the uh, archives that I was looking at um that there is this children's area. Yes. Um, do you, and it's called what? Little Lemons? Little Lemons Art Park. And it, we, it started out as the Little Lemons Art and Entertainment Area. Now it's the Little Lemons Art Park. And it really started the 25th anniversary. Because there, was no, there was no children's area prior, but when we felt with the 25th anniversary, we wanted to do something special. And there was an opportunity to apply for a grant that was relatively new, and it was called Arts Across Minnesota Festival Grant. So we wrote a grant, and we were awarded that um, in 1990 for the 1998 event, which was the 25th anniversary. And I'm, yep. Uh, and so that event then, and at that point, the event was still in July. Now it's in June, the end of June, but it was still that uh, first week in July at that point. Um, and we were awarded, I, the exact amount, I believe, was 20 I have to get my exact numbers, but like $22,000. It was a significant grant. So we were able to offer a noon concert featuring Leo Kotke, well-known performer. Oh, it was wonderful. And we packed the same place that the orchestra played, uh, he played at noon. We packed the place uh, for a first-time-ever noon concert. Uh, We also added that's when we partnered with um, folks to do the children's area and start that Little Lemons area which really worked with the Paramount Arts District, that whole art community, and they brought in, you know, all kinds of art projects, a potting wheel, uh, performance art, storytelling, painting, you know, um, making of art. The the kids got to make art and take it with them. So it was just 
wonderful. And and we were able to figure out a way to continue that after because it was so successful. So you've been really doing that for another, you know, 15, since 98. Since 1998. Yes, isn't that wild? So when you talk about the place was packed, do you usually set down chairs in the mall area yes. for people to seat in, in about, what, a 1,000? We fill it as far back as we can, and it's either it's between a thousand and twelve hundred, kind of depending on what else we have in the mall. But people also bring their lawn chairs. They sit on the grass. They sit on the steps. I mean, it's and and people sit um, even not really right on the mall, but behind the mall, those grassy knoll areas, and people sit there on their blankets and their lawn chairs and just hang out and watch. So what? What do and you then, ask? Oh, oh, I was just saying. Then people shop and listen as well, because you have people still shopping, but they can hear the orchestra. So performing. you have a sound system. So the the orchestra in a venue like Ritchie Auditorium wouldn't need to be amplified, mm-hmm. but out on the mall, then you have sound yes. towers, so that the sound really permeates the entire mall area. Yes, it does. And back, it, probably half of the art fair is covered in the sound. The other half is behind buildings and things, but. The orchestra is heard by probably that half, the, that whole side. Of the so what do you estimate as uh, uh, at, an average population for Lemonade Concert and Art Fair? Well, if you take the whole day and the other, so we utilize, uh, we try to do some snapshots of counts in pocketed areas. We take pictures from the roof. We use our shuttle counts because we have a shuttle that takes people up and down. And that's only, again, a portion of the people that attend. And then shuttle you, from uh, from K and Q lot down on the south end of campus up. So to parking, parking. There's lots of parking down there, and we bring them up then from there. Um, and you and then the turnover because people come. We have a we have a wave that comes in the morning and they stay for lunch. Then we have a wave that just comes in for lunch and maybe stays an hour after. Then we have the afternoon wave, the early dinner wave, the late dinner and concert wave. So we've estimated anywhere depending on you know the weather, which has I been. Fairly ideal most time, most years, um, between ten and I think at our most we had fourteen one year where we kind of estimated that there was massive. And we also talked to artists about sales and food vendors about sales and just so you're we, saying thousands, thousands, thousands. Oh 10, yes, ten to fourteen thousand. thousand. Yes, and that you know in some respects I think that could be considered low because the event is spread across the whole campus. So you know we count the main areas. But those side areas where people are all shopping, we, you know, it's hard to count those. So we kind of add all the things together. Then we have kind of a benchmark. So if it seems less than what we the last year, then we know we can kind of calculate. And again, it's it's kind of a your best estimate, um, which is how a lot of those larger events that are come and go events, you kind of have to use all your data points and pull many it together. different resources yep. to, to add to that. So you talked about people coming in the morning through the lunch hour. Yep. So is there food? That is available. Yes. Oh, yes. And we have gone from, we have a food service on campus, so they would provide the food, I think, early on, I believe, when I first came. They provided all kinds of different types of food, but they weren't set up to do fair, you know, fair type food, really, but we used them for many years. Then there was an idea, maybe we should offer other opportunities for food vendors, and we worked with the food service on campus, and they're like, yeah, we can't do those types of things. Bring those people in. We'll do our booth. So then we extended, and I can't. I that might have been around that 1998 time frame too, where we added that in, and then now that has continued to be a staple um, to the event. So you have outside vendors, and yes. what types of things do they sell? Everything from um, fresh squeezed lemonade, which is a big one because the lemonade concert and art fair it makes sense, obviously, um, to corn on the cob, to gyros, to mini donuts, to cheese curds. Uh, we've had healthy, op- healthy options places coming in and selling some of those types of things. Sodexo, the food service company now, and then it was Aramark before, sell chicken breasts, burgers, you know, those traditions. We've had, like, pork chops on a stick, you know, lots of creative foods, um, you name it. There's been some cultural foods um, that we've tried. You know, the vendors bring a wide variety of food. Oh, so people could come for lunch. They yes. can come for dinner. And have two totally they, different things. And, ha- <laughs> and snack throughout the entire you day. You bet. I want to have you um, talk a little bit about this connection with the greater St. Cloud community, mm-hmm. with Festival Wheels, Wings, and Water, and now Granite City Days, yes. and the mayor's office. Yes. Oh, uh, very 
great connection. So we sit, the person that's really responsible for heading up the lemonade from the campus, which was me for a while, now it's another uh, person in our office, and Ginny would sit on this uh, the committee for the city festival, which was Wheels Wings, then moved to Granite City Days. And the mayor is highly involved in that, and there you know was a chair of that committee. So we would be at the table helping to plan the citywide festival, but really focusing on our event being successful. And that event, has, since I've been here, has always been the kickoff event for the festival, for the city festival. So Lemonade Concert and Art Fair always hosted the opening ceremony for the festival. Because it's always Thursday. Exactly. And the festival goes Thursday through Sunday. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and they're all, it's always the third full weekend and, yes. in June. The, the, yep, the Thursday of the third full weekend in, in June. June. Okay. Well, no, I shouldn't say the third. The last full weekend. Let's say that. It's not always the third. At one time, it's because it's always the last full weekend in June. The Thursday of the last full weekend in June. Not necessarily the third, but the last full. Which we try to plan that out well in advance so everybody's aware of the dates. So the mayor has um, um, involvement with that opening ceremony because yes. it's part of the festival. Yes. But he presents all the High Five Awards. Huh? Yes, and now they're called the Rock. So they were the High Five. They've switched now. They're called the Rock On Awards. But they're, yeah, they award people. They take nominations for community uh, groups, people, and individuals that have impacted. And there's criteria out there. And then he does present those. And we usually feature some type of uh, performance act that is a local person that the mayor gets to select with that committee and works with us on implementing that. And then, you know, really it is the president of the university and the mayor always do a lemonade toast to open the ceremony, and it just kind of showcases that partnership between the university and the community. A real strong town-gown connection. Yes. And it it has been that way um, really since the very beginning. Absolutely. Yes, it has. So... What would be uh, uh, your greatest challenge with putting together Lemonade? It is an outdoor event. Yes. And you do have a symphony orchestra who, uh, I think, weather permitting, would not be able to perform on the mall. Yes. So is there a rain site that is then available to them? How do you manage that whole weather? Oh, it's part of our 10-page production schedule. Margaret. <laughs> it really is. And I will tell you, this is very strange, but from 1997, which was the first event I was involved in, until three years ago, I did not have to implement the rain plan. We definitely, maybe two times, had light sprinkles that we were able to get a, a heads up from our weather person on campus. Bob Weissman would tech, call and tell us, okay, the sprinklers are coming in 15 minutes right over St. Cloud State. So we would let everybody know to cover up, and then we'd wipe down after that. So we had that maybe twice, but in all those years, until three years ago, there was never a rain plan imp- implementation. We finally had our first one three years ago, in I think 2011. And the rain plan, and that, again, I think it happened before I came, so I felt like I was sort of good luck. But you anyway, were- before I came... They did, and then we had to move it inside to Richie. So we do a intense scrutiny on the weather and play by play, and we're in touch with the orchestra folks and with the grounds and with the weather person, and we're all talking because it's rain or shine for the art fair. So if it rains during the day and stops at four in time for the orchestra to set up and do their sound check and perform outside because it's clear, no problem. It's it's just the instruments and that piece of the puzzle that we have to be really careful with. So we're really engaged with the orchestra executive director and their stage manager on the decision with the weather person, with all of the folks we work with on campus too. Um, And if there's severe weather, that's a whole nother ball game that again, I haven't had to deal with, but I know two years before I got here or a year before they did have to deal with that. Uh, So yes, it's huge. That weather is huge. But even, even just this last year, we had to move the event into Ritchie. So really the rain site for the orchestra is literally next door to the mall. So it's pretty seamless because the sound is not needed really in Ritchie. The orchestra performs there often. And so it's seamless to move inside. And how many can you handle inside? Over nine, a little over 900. It's 904 seats, but we've got some accessible seating as well. So about 910 or so. And so that does shrink down the audience that we can have here at the orchestra. However, if it's raining outside, you know, we already lose a few people. But the one thing we did the first year we did it is we kept the sounds because the sound system was already set up outside even with the rain, and the rain kind of had slowed down. We left the sound system outside connected to the orchestra performance, 
so they were able to hear the orchestra outside while it was performing inside, and that was very cool. So even if you know the rain had stopped, people could be outside listening. They couldn't see them, but they could hear them. So, but yeah, so there's a lot, a lot to that rain planning piece because we've got the children's area to deal with. We move that inside out with Memorial Center. We've got roving artists. Paul can just move under our overhang because he's moving. But the other artists, we have to make decisions. Do we move them into Atwood? What do we do with them? And all your vendor artists have canopies. Yes. Some of them, I suspect your watercolorists um, are packing up. They yep. can't risk uh, rain on, on their works yep. of art. But everyone else seems to kind of manage that. Yep. Um, what did you refer to it as? Uh, all, all weather event, or yeah, and and really, it does depend too on the weather event. Is it a ten minute shower? No problem. But if it's going to be ongoing showers, we tend to have vendors, and we've all, only once since I've been here, and that was this past year. We ended up at um, it was great, the busiest event we've had. We could tell everybody was selling. There was more people. It was much more busy on campus. And then around, I think, 5.36 ish, all of a sudden the rain started and it looked and we got reports that it wasn't really going to cease. So you artists were asking, can we go? Because it looks like this is going to keep going. So we can't, we, do, we say rain or shine and you're required to stay. But we, the reality check is if, the, if customers aren't going to come, we understand the packing up. And this year that happened more because the rain event continued. But the orchestra, full, Richie still went on without a hitch. In Ritchie, still performed, and we had great attendance during the day. And then we just had a few artists pack up and go, and less shoppers, but some diehards that brought their umbrellas and came and shopped. That's excellent. Yeah. So you're already underway planning your 42nd. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, annual. What would you say, Jessica, are the key components of having uh, an event become an annual event, and especially with that rich of a history? You know, I think it is people that are passionate about it, that are connected to it. I, you know, a plan, finding something that will work, that is, it resonates with the community. I, this is obviously a needed event for the community, that art focus is needed. Because otherwise, I don't think it would sustain. I think people wouldn't come back. But people plan vacations around it. They take the Thursday, you know, people are like, you have it on a Thursday? Really? Not a weekend? And people take off the day or they come two hours over lunch or they take off early. People plan around the Lemonade Concert and Art Fair. I've heard it time and time again, and I see it every year. So I think, you know, it's built into a tradition because it was the right event at the right time, and it's continued to build and evolve. I think if we haven't, wouldn't have changed anything or added any value, I, I don't know. if it would have. It probably, maybe it would have continued, maybe not. Um, you know, the financial piece is, is still kind of a struggle. We have to continue. It's a self-supporting event. You know, at one time there was support from student fees. We changed that. There, it, the model has slowly evolved for fu funding the event, and it's now really a self-sustaining event. All the money that's generated goes into the event, and then it comes out the other end, and then we keep that cycle going. So the event maintains. And we do write grants. You know, that the Arts Across Minnesota was a huge grant. There hasn't been that same level of opportunity, but we have received grants from the Central Minnesota Arts Board many times, way back in the day, and then more recently again, to bring, like we brought a glass blower demonstration, which was unique. You know, this year we had the Art Student Union out on the mall, and we're really connecting with the colleges and schools. So there's, there's just, I think because we keep evolving and we keep adding value and connecting more people to the event and continuing partnerships, I think that's why it's been successful. So in that evaluation piece yes. that you say begins really the evening of, yeah, exactly. uh, of the event, it's always the eye to how to improve. Yes. How do we make it a little bit better? Exactly. How do we keep it a little bit fresh? And yet there are those who really want the very traditional exactly. aspects yes. of it. And my guess is as well that the connection with the city festival Huge. Yes. is also an added value Definitely. that it, it becomes the kickoff event for a weekend that's really filled with a beautiful array of activities and events throughout the greater St. Cloud area. Definitely. Yeah. So, so Jessica, my last question for w would you be, if you, money was not an object, what would you imagine Lemonade to be like for their 50th oh um, anniversary? Huh? Oh, my, that is a huge question. 
Well, I mean, we've added a. I forgot to talk about adding. We added the farmers market piece to this too. We've just added lots of different things. I guess I would, I would, fill the campus. I would extend the vend, allow more artists in, extend the vendors further. I would expand the children's area to really add in more, um, even uh, performance art, have theater, more parts of art. I would involve more of the colleges and schools around the arts and music. Um, I would have probably try to have, you know, the orchestra, but have a couple other major performers at various times throughout the day on the main stage, because we do lots of smaller ones, but doing that noon again and maybe doing a three and then doing the orchestra. Um, you know, I haven't really thought, so that's a great question that we should start visioning forward because that's only, you know, eight years away. <laughs> We need to get working suppose, on that. It is not that far away, so. It isn't. It really will no. come very quickly. And I would involve lots of school, even school partnerships with even, you know, K-12, maybe St. John, St. Ben's, and St. Cloud Community and Technical College. Maybe we extend beyond, you know, and just really make it a huge, huge, huge. You could handle 20,000 visitors to campus? No problem. No problem. Jessica, it's been an absolute delight talking with you about the history of the Lemonade Concert and Art Fair. Keep up the great work. It's enjoyable, to, and I love revisiting it. It just makes you get excited all over again when you think about all the, the history. And again, the history is way before me. I just took over from where someone left off and just continued, and now we have others doing that work, and I get to be involved in a different way. And I think we all just kind of continue to support it, you know, in many different ways. So it's exciting. It's a it's a, an amazing tradition and a piece of history around here, and it, it will live on, I'm sure. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, Margaret. I feel like I missed a whole bunch of stuff. But you know what?